again to the Academy on Computers. This session is all about how programs work. We'll be talking to programmers and doing some programming. Our guide and expert guest, as usual, is Mr. Shutterfield. And Jim, you probably can't remember a time when programming wasn't second nature to you. But are there still some problems after all these years of programs together? Well, even after a lot of experience, you have to be very uh, careful when you're writing programs for a computer. It's very idiot-minded, and it will always do exactly what you tell it to do and not what you mean it to do. So what you have to do is to make sure that all of those simple little instructions are all, you're not missing any, and that they're all correct. And that takes a little bit of care and perseverance. One of the things is to, it's almost like you're looking over your own shoulder, checking up on everything you do. You need to be careful, because computers are very literal. Now, the sort of thing that you try to do is to shape a program in some sort of a logical format using three fundamental building blocks. The first block, of course, is the action commands, the ones that actually do something. So you say, print this or calculate that, and the computer will do that. The second building block is the decision one. If yes, go over here. If no, go over somewhere else. But decide on what you want to do. And the third major building block that you use in computer programs is the repetition, where you go back and repeat something that you've previously done in the computer. Action, decision, repetition. Could you demonstrate these building blocks with a program for us? Yes, I have a program over here that does uh, metric conversion. I'll convert uh, weight, measure, area, volume, temperature, and all of these sort of things. And we can show how these elements are working together to make the program by answering some of the questions. It's asking, what do we want to convert? We'll choose, for example, the first one on the list and weight, W-E-I-G-H-T. T, and when I press return, the program will make a decision. It knows I'm not longer talking about temperature or volume. I'm talking about weight. Now, which way do we want to convert? From metric or to metric? Well, we'll convert something from metric. And so once again, we will give the computer some information. And from that information, it will make a decision. OK, now it recognizes that we're in weights and we're going from metric to the older ways of measurements by looking at this thing. We can go grams to ounces, grams to pounds, kilograms to ounces. We'll pick option number four, kilograms to pounds. Once again, we have been making decisions and the computer has done new things based upon what we type in. Now we come to the calculation that says number of kilograms, we put in 10 kilograms. And immediately we do so, we're told 10 kilograms is equal to 22 pounds. That's the action part of our computer operation. Now we get to the next step. Convert more kilograms, yes or no. Now if you say yes, it will go back to the action, ask us for more kilograms, and that would be a repetition. We'll say no, but even then, the computer will still do a repetition, a different one. It's back to the beginning, it's asking in the question. So either way, we have a repetition. We've seen all three parts of the program working together. There's one thing, though, that the computer must have known there were 2.2 pounds per kilogram by the answer you got. Mm. Now, you didn't type that in. No, I didn't type uh, it in. How did it know that? That value was written right in the program. Since 2.2 is always the conversion factor that we use in this case, it was built into the program, and numbers or values that are built in programs are called counts. Now, most numbers are constants, and sometimes the computer has to handle values which can change from time to time. For example, we type in the value 10 and kilograms, and we have typed in any number. So the computer program had to leave that part blank and accept the number that we typed in. That sort of a number which can change is called a variable, and that's the way a computer can do different things because it's accepting numbers from you. So these variables are really blanks, which, which I fill in when I run the program? Well, that's partly true. There are also other ways that the computer fills in for itself. For example, you remember we put in pounds, 10 kilograms. That's the part we put in. The computer printed out 22 pounds. It fell in that blank itself. That was also a variable. So some variables we fill in and the variables, for example, totals and things like that, the computer does itself. The programmer leaves these variables for us. I mean, he really communicates then with, with the user. Yes, that's correct. The programmer, when he wrote this program some time ago, 
left those blanks in there for you to fill in. So it's a form of communication between you and the camera. The programmer anticipated the kind of things that you would need to do when you ran this camera. Right. I'd like you to meet another programmer, a young man named Paul Kirschberger. Paul is a grade nine student who writes programs for Schoolhouse Computing Limited. And Paul will show us a program he created called Walking Path. Paul, how are you? Oh, well, Paul. Paul, show us the program that you have here. All right, well, what Walking Math is, the program that will teach students mathematics. Okay. But in a very unusual way. Mm -hmm. What we've got is an old print coming out on the screen, animated, with little legs sticking out the bottom of them. Right, I can see them walking along there. Mm -hmm. So we have 3 plus 3 on the screen, and that should make 6, right? All right, so we enter in our answer, and our answer comes out. And the little man walks out telling us that we got it correct. And we have a little tune, too. Right. Very good. Well, we've done that question. Let's do another yeah, one. Now. Okay. okay, here's your row. I can see those legs moving there. And then here comes the six. So, zero plus six, that's the same as before. Six. All right. Okay. We're being consistent. And the little man tells us we got it correct. Doing pretty good. Yeah. Okay. And there's that dancing correct statement. Mm -hmm. There's the progress report that tells us that we've done well. Gives us our present level, and since we've done so well, it will, if we were to take a drill, it would move us up a level. So we're, we're pretty high-graded students. Mm -hmm. I see. So you have a report here that tells the student how he or she has been doing. I suppose we'll be also in front of the teacher to see how that goes. Right. Also, the student can proceed up the levels at their own pace. Okay, very good. Paul, I'd like to ask you about this program and about how it came about. When did you first start to write this program? The idea of a math quiz came to me back in grade 6 when I first started programming. So that's three years ago you were in grade 6. Right. And the first idea of a math program was to simply have two numbers on the screen and ask for the answer. Uh-huh. But as that idea developed, I found that and interesting just seeing two numbers on the screen, so I changed to bold print, in which you'd get two large numbers onto the screen. But that also became a little boring after a little while. And then I decided on animation. So to add a little, a little humorous note to it, I put uh, little legs on the numbers. Okay, so you really wrote this in three separate parts. You first wrote a program that just had the numbers, and then you added mm -hmm. the big block numbers to it, and then finally you added the legs. Right. Okay, when did you finish the program? I finished this program just earlier this year. Okay, so you've been working on it bit by bit over a period of three years now. Right. Okay, and it's gone through three phases. Okay, mm -hmm. when you first wrote the program, you, you had the idea, what put the idea in your head to write a program like this? Well, at the time I wrote it, I was in a gifted program in which we were just beginning off in microcomputer programming. Mm -hmm. At that point, I had done it merely as an exercise in developing programming skill. Okay. Then later on, as my skill developed, so did the program, and I just start adding new pieces to it. So you did it partly as an exercise and partly for the fun of it? Right. And then you mm -hmm. saw more possibilities that you could do when you changed it? Right, and then I saw the value in the classroom. At which point I added in options for the teacher and the various reports to give at the end. Right, okay, marvelous. Mm -hmm. Now, the first time you decided to do this program, you wrote down all of the instructions on how to do it. Right. Okay, and you, you typed them into the computer. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Did it start working right away? Definitely not. I'd spent perhaps an hour or two hours typing it actually in, but I'd spent the better part of an afternoon just going through it and correcting errors I'd made in the program. Okay, so, so we all make errors and we make these bugs, and one of the parts of writing a program then is to work through it and work these bugs out and get the right. program looking good and looking clean. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you decided to redo it, and then once again you had another idea and you redid it again. Right. Is this a usual, after you've done a program, to decide to, to go through it again? Well, I think with any program that you've developed, it really is never finished. I mean, you can always think of new ideas to add to it to make it better than it presently is. And most programs do go through this type of development stage. Okay, now, when you finally did put the, the program to bed, you had it put together, you had it debugged, and you had it working, is that the sort of thing you feel good about? Did you really feel great when you had that program ready? I think so. There's a definite feeling of satisfaction knowing that you've worked with this program and you've brought it from a small skeletal framework to a large program. Okay, uh, there the times when it was the other way, that you really felt awful about the program. It really felt like not working at all. Oh, definitely. There are many times in the process of writing the program when I really felt frustrated with it, and times I would just put it away and give up with it. You just get just disgusted. Just totally put it away and forgot about it 
until another later point when I'd pick it up again and start adding to it. So you had new ideas and you said maybe, I think I know what's wrong with that? Right. Sort of thing? Okay, very good. Now, if somebody wanted to start programming, because we have a lot of people who haven't even begun yet, what sort of things would you tell them about what kind of skills make for a good programmer? Well, the most important of all is creativity. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to think of a good and original idea for a program. You can't sit down and start typing before you know what you want to do. So this isn't a mechanical thing. It's really the ideas you have that are as well, important. The, the mechanics come into play a little later on. Mm -hmm. Once you've got your idea, then the mechanics come into play, and you've got to sit down and implement that idea into a program. That's also where a little aspect of patience has to come into it when you have to sit down and start working through all the problems. The program's really partly a creative thing, and do you think that the program reveals the personality of the programmer? Do you think you have a style? I think every programmer, the same way as an artist would or a writer would, has their own distinct style in writing a program. And you could recognize other people's programs, you think? Sure, definitely. Oh, that's very good. So, we have this kind of a program, and it's partly planning and it's partly doing. Do you consider yourself a technician in writing the code or an artist in creating the program? How do you feel about that? I think in programming, it's a mixture of the two areas. There's definite creativity, for without it, you couldn't have the idea of the program but the aspect of, the, of a technician comes in later on, similar to the writing of a book, where you'd first be involved with the creating of the storyline, and then, of course, you get into sentence structure later on. I see. Very good. Paul, thank you. It's been lovely talking to you. Thank you. We really appreciated your help on this. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Kirschberger. Jim and I will be back with some more guests right after this. Attention Academy participants, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, the number to call for information about the Computer Academy is area code 416-484-2648. In addition, a computer specialist is standing by on weekends to answer your questions. If you're having trouble understanding a particular point or carrying out a procedure, call area code 416-484-2614 Saturday and Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. to noon. Jim, we have with us in the studio four people who are quite familiar with computer programming. An at-home user, a University of Waterloo engineering student, a secondary school computer science teacher, and an instructional computing specialist. Let's talk about programming. Good. I gather that all of the people we have here have some experience with programming, and I'd like to ask each one of them, why do you write computer programs? Arnold. Well, I have this machine that listens to all my ideas, never gets bored the way the people around me do when I talk about programming. Uh, and uh, I have a chance to try out all sorts of ideas. And, uh, Good. David? It's fun. I uh, enjoy solving problems and figuring out how I'm going to tackle a problem. And I also find that I can do things faster if I write the program than trying to find someone else to write it. Fine. Gordon? Well, I agree. I think that it is fun. You get immediate interaction, and you've got an environment where you can work with your own thoughts, your ideas, and push them around, and get something out of it. That's something you can't do otherwise too easily. Mm -hmm. Sue? Well, I find that often with a computer, it can really help you. As a teacher in the classroom, you can write a little program of eight and ten lines that will really help you with something in the classroom or at home. You might be trying to do a little bit of arithmetic and just write a program, and there you are. You've got something helping you all the time. Okay, good. I'd like to ask about what may happen in the future. To get the benefit of computers in the future, to be able to use them efficiently, do you think that people have to really have a good understanding of programming? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by having a good understanding of programming. I think that people should know something about what programming activity is. I think that people could live without knowing that, but I think if you're talking about people who are literate, culturally literate, and people who are going to try to want to be able to fit into the functional environment that they're going to fit into, naturally they should learn something about it, and it'll be something like sciences today or, or any of the other things, that mathematics, uh, things which people may not work in a detail level when they get occupations, but they know something about because it'll pursue them through their lives in yeah. that sense. Well, I don't quite agree with you. Uh, knowing about programming does help you to understand about computers, but there are more and more sophisticated computers, and the computer can actually do a lot of the programming. You have to understand what it is that you want, and you have to tell that to the computer. But the computer can help you go along, and there are systems that will actually program. So that's one way of getting programs. But in order to get, get use, make use of the full benefit of the computers, though, um, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to be restricted by what someone else has already set up for you. And 
to get the full use of it, you're going to have to be able to have some method of telling it what to do that you want it to do that someone else hasn't already thought of. So if you have some basic idea of what's involved in a program, um, then you'll be able to have that control over the machine. Let's look at it another way. In the future, do you think that programming will be a basic literacy tool so that we should be teaching it in our schools? David, what do you think? I think to some degree you'll have to know something about computer programming, like looping and, and um, control structures, just to have the idea of what exactly is going on inside of a program. But you certainly don't have to know how to write great programs and, and do a lot of programming, because a lot of that will be done for you already. You can use a computer without knowing how to program it, but to be literate, I think you have to understand something about what's involved in programming. Gordon? Well, I think that um, it is a basic literacy tool in the sense that we, have, uh, we try to acquire cultural literacy knowledge about our environment. But from the point of view, I, again, I'd like to say that uh, people can function very well without computers in their lives. However, the school system is attempting to turn out people which are more rounded, and I think that that's what our task and our goal should be, to try to make these people basically literate and functional in this environment. And therefore, they should know something about programming, and we should try to incorporate the concepts of programming in the curriculum, in problem-solving activity. In that sense, I think it would be very useful, and I agree with Sue said about that, that applying this across the board. Okay. People seem to have <coughs> different feelings about programs. Some people really like certain programs and hate others. What's the difference between a program that you really like and a program that you really hate? Arnold. Well, programs you really like are ones that you, uh, not that I like, are the ones that you can sit down and, and you read the instruction booklet later, and you can, they're, they're, they're so set up that you, you almost can't make a mistake to get into them. Uh, other programs you have to spend, if you come back to them after six months, uh, it's gone. Some programs are like riding a bicycle. Once you do it, you've got it, and others vanish uh, if you're not using them all the time or using the books to, to I like the it. kind of programs where you don't have to do too much typing because I'm a fumble fingers <laughs> and if you only have to type in a number from a menu or just one keystroke to get the program going that that's great and I like directions and I, I really like them when I get started out but as I go along I like programs that say do you want to read these instructions now and I usually say no but if you have to I hate that I'm developing a liking for programs which make very good use of graphics and which allow you to use a, a, a paddle or a joystick to focus on the thing you want rather than having to use the keyboard and so to select by uh, addressing the areas of the screen itself and so that you're going through the thing, moving from idea to idea, task to task. You're never even thinking about the keyboard or the computer itself. You're just thinking about the things that you want to do and the tasks that you want to get at. Okay, now some people talk about <coughs> friendly computers and some people talk about friendly programs. And I'm not sure which it is, the computers or the programs that are friendly, but whichever it is, what do you call a friendly computer or a friendly program? David? A friendly program is a program, or even a friendly computer, is, is a computer or a program that has already thought of some of the errors that you're likely to make and has handled them in a good manner. So if you type in an error, it doesn't destroy the entire um, process you've just been doing. It says, hey, you've made an error. Here's uh, some likely ways to correct it. Okay. Is there any particular kind of program that's really good for people to... Is there any kind of person who writes programs? Is there any person who makes a good programmer? Is I think it's a person who's willing to listen because a program has to do something that a person wants in the long run. We, we all write programs here for fun and, and to, to help us at home and that kind of thing. But somewhere along the line, most programs are written to do a job, and the programmer has to listen to that person and produce a program that does that job. Could anybody do that? Well, I, you need some kind of technical training, I think, if you're going to do it as a career. But most people, with a little bit of help, can get started, start on a machine, maybe get a manual or something like that, can get going, one or two simple courses, and they're away doesn't take much to get a, a grasp of what's going on. Okay, I'd like to put that a different way to Arnold. Arnold, suppose that somebody said to you, I think I'm really dumb, I don't think I could program a computer. Would you agree and say, well, some people just can't do it, or would you disagree? No, I'd, I'd grab them by the arm and pull them in front of the computer and let them try some stuff. So you think anybody can program a computer? Yeah, there, there are programs that are... You know, four-year-olds can run, and well, sometimes better than <laughs> big people. But uh, yeah. you know, there's some l kind of language or programming technique that just about anybody can 
I think, see how think, it's think there's a basic problem too that a lot of people think that you have to be really good at math to get into programming, and that's not true. It's been shown that people who have good verbal ability that, that are able to speak well or to write are, are very good with computers as well. And we don't all have to be mathematicians. In fact, there are some programs that have no math in them at all. You don't need math. Okay, now suppose I know nothing at all about writing programs, and I say, I'd like to try my hand at that. What sort of advice would you give people who wanted to go ahead and... Uh, what are the first things you should tell them about how to write a program? David? The first thing you have to do is try to understand what you're trying to do and figure out how you would do it yourself. And then once you understand how you would do the task yourself, then you break it down into the steps, the small steps that you actually do, and then tell a computer how to do each of those small steps. Do you agree, Gordon? Well, I think <coughs> when you're designing a program, you have to think, all right, what is going into it? What is going to go out of it? And have a very clear idea. The problem is that I've seen a lot of people program, and they don't know exactly what's going to come out of it. They're just sort of fiddling their way through it. And so if you have a design, and you think about what it is that this thing is going to produce for you, I think you're talking about good programming activity. The in-between steps tend to take care of themselves, because now you know what it is that you're doing. Programming cannot be done, and this is a real misconception, it cannot be done without design or plan. People, I mean, there are some people who are brilliant who can do that, but for the average, or normal, ordinary, red-blooded Canadian, programming activity means thinking through what it is that's going to happen. Okay, now we've had a lot of emphasis here on planning, and I'd like to follow that up once again. Is there a difference between planning and programming, or is it all part of the same process? Do you plan first and then program, or yeah. are you doing them both together? Sue? I always like to plan first and then yeah. program, but I know that some people can actually go through the programming as they go. I like to have a step-by-step -step guide, and I find that if, if you just write your ideas down on paper, the program actually falls into place by itself if you know the right words for the program. Does that mean that you shouldn't change your mind once you start? Oh, no, because quite often when you write something down on paper, it makes you see something clearly, and you may, in fact, revise your idea four or five times. I'd like to throw this one out to all of the guests here. Have you ever written a program and started out to do one thing and changed your mind and had the program do something completely different? Absolutely. Does that seem that everybody's nodding it's, here? It's, it's very, very easy to do that. Um, two, two things occur. One thing, you decide that what you wanted to do in the first place really wasn't suitable, so it's obvious. And sometimes you just get so excited about what you're doing and something really neat is happening on the screen and you, so you decide to follow up on that and before you know it, it's not what you started out, but it's really good. And Jim, and on that note, we have to end. Thank you to our guests and Jim and I will be right back to answer your questions. On Bits and Bytes next week, the topic will be storing information. Billy Van and Luba Goy will show you how to save programs on cassette and on disc. We'll learn terms such as database, file, record, and field. That's at 9 p.m. At 9.30 on the Academy, I'll be back with Jim Butterfield and our guests for more hands-on demonstrations and exploration. So next week, watch Bits and Bytes at 9 and join us at 9.30. Okay, Jim, here are the questions that have come in since the last program, both in the mail and on the phone. Program 2, Jim, you said that the IBM PC needed to have the basic language loaded into its RAM. I'm sure that I heard that this machine has basic already built in. What's the story? Okay, the IBM personal computer does have basic built into its ROM, but there's also a different basic that you can load into the RAM of the machine if you want it. So you really have a choice of basics. The point that I was trying to make was that there are three ways programs get into the machine. First, you can build it into the machine. Secondly, you can load it into the machine, into the RAM. Or thirdly, you can plug it in. Perhaps the IBM wasn't the best example. Perhaps I might have picked, say, a CPM machine in which, in which BASIC definitely has to be loaded in. All right, well, with the IBM, though, I mean, if BASIC is built in, why would you want to load it in? Is there more than one kind of BASIC? Yes, this is something that sometimes confuses beginners. You actually have not one kind of basic, but a choice of slightly different basics. Sometimes that's called dialects of basic, and you have to pick which one you want. It varies on many machines. On the Radio Shack, for example, you might have level one va basic or an extended basic. On the Apple, you might have integer basic versus, micro versus Apple soft basic, and so on. You often have a choice of which language you use. Okay, Jim, we're still on language with this question. It's been asked, what language is this course this academy based on? Well, the academy itself isn't based on any language. We're talking about
computers and not languages. In the hands-on guides that, that become part of the academy material, we do talk about the uh, simple programming which is done in BASIC, which is certainly the most popular language for small computers. But later you'll find, Jack, that we'll talk about languages. We'll have a whole show on languages in the future. So once again, stay tuned. Right, oh, Jim. You said all computers are essentially the same. Somebody asked, what about analog computers? Well, that's a good question. Analog computers are definitely a different breed of thing. There aren't very many analog computers around anymore, and you're not likely to see any if you go down to your local computer store. But there is a type of computer called an analog computer, which uses a totally different internal principle of operation. A digital computer, all of the circuits are either on or off, yes or no, one or zero. But an analog computer can hold any intermediate level. It can be partly on, or it can be more on or less on. It's a continuously varying signal that's handled with an analog computer. That's definitely not the same as a digital computer. Perhaps I might have said digital computers are fundamentally all the same. They work on the same principles. Okay, several people have asked this one. I have tried listing the programs I received on tape from the Academy, but they seem difficult to read. Yes, that can be a problem. These programs were not created primarily to be read or studied in terms of how to write a program. They're rather printed up and added to with a number of cosmetic features, and that makes it hard to read the essential part of the program that does the main part of the work. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the hands-on guide contains in the back an evaluation form in which you can look through and evaluate a program and see whether it meets the... Uh, educational goals particularly you have there and so one of the things you can do with the program is evaluate it and you're going to use it and see the sort of things that it does but those particular kinds of programs that come on tape and disc weren't meant for simply reading for educational purposes okay Jim I worry about accidentally erasing programs how can I avoid this mistake well there are several levels on which you can answer that question first of all if the program is in the RAM of your computer Certainly, if you turn the computer off, the program goes away, but by that time, you should have a copy on disk or tape, so you should be safe from erasure. Secondly, if you have something on cassette tape and you're afraid that you'll just press that record button by accident, just as with an audio tape, there's a little breakout in the back of the cassette tape. If you break it out, you'll be interlocked against recording. On disk, the equivalent thing you have is a write protect tab. Stick it over the proper part of the disk, and the disk will not allow itself to be recorded. Of course, there's other things you should do with magnetic materials. Don't get them too hot. Don't expose them to strong magnetic fields. If you do that, you'll also be endangering the information that's recorded there. Jim, thanks very much. That's all the time we have for this program. Next, storing information. This is Jack Livesley with Jim Butterfield inviting you to join us then on The Academy.